Man, this printing gets smaller and smaller. <laughs> when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circ circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and, <clears throat> excuse me, and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in the spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. Before we dive into this passage, there's a quick uh, one-minute video I'd like you to check out to help give some context. of the life of Jesus and then composed this account. And the story begins up in the hills of Jerusalem, the place where Israel's ancient prophets said that God himself would come one day to establish his kingdom over all the earth. In the city is the temple run by the priests. And one of them, named Zechariah, was working in the temple when he had a vision that freaks him out. An angel appears and says that he and his wife will have a son. What's this all about? Well, Zechariah and his wife, we're told, are very old. They've never been able to have children. And Luke's setting up a parallel here with Abraham and Sarah, the great ancestors of Israel, because they too were very old and could never have kids. Yet God gave them a son, Isaac, which is how the whole story of Israel began. And so Luke's implying here that God's about to do something that significant for this people once again. The angel tells Zechariah to name the son John. And then he says that the son's going to fulfill a promise of Israel's ancient prophets, that somebody would come one day to prepare Israel to meet their God when he arrived to rule in Jerusalem. Right, just keep that in the back of your minds as we get into this passage. And let's pray. Once again, God, we, we thank you and uh, we pray for your presence uh, to speak through your word and to deliver your word to each one of us in the particular way that we need to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, come with me in your imaginations right now to the village of Iglulik in far northern Canadian Arctic. 
It's a place where you'll see igloos, where people hunt seals and burn oil lamps. And on a particular day in mid-January, you'll find the entire town gathered for a very special celebration. Even though it's negative 40 degrees outside and it's dark, everybody's in high spirits because they are waiting for something very special to happen. They are about to see the sun rise for the first time in over a month. You see, they live so far north that in the winter they enter a polar night where for more than a month the sun never rises. It's completely dark. And so it's a big deal when it finally does, the day that the sun is going to come up, they gather and they feast and they wait and they watch, they behold as the orange disk of the sun just breaks over the edge of the horizon for a few seconds and goes back down again. The first day, if you can call it a day. To me, that captures the meaning of Christmas because we celebrate the coming of a long expected Messiah who is a light in our dark and sinful world. And we affirm that this, that Jesus is coming, is the, the one thing that we should orient our lives around. He's the center of our lives. Unfortunately, I think we often fall short of that. We pay homage to Jesus in our carols and in our church services, But often, he's just kind of the little baby who sits up on the mantle, and our lives go on as they they will, and in a few months, a few weeks, we put him back in the box. And I don't want to just keep Christ in Christmas and accommodate him into our lives, but I want us to orbit around him, to have us long for him and, and expect him and and celebrate when he comes. If you need help doing that, like I do, um, Zechariah's song in this passage can give us some inspiration because he was a man um, whose life centered on the coming of the Savior. And he's a man who's been watching and waiting for him like one of these Inuit peoples in Igloolik, waiting for the sun to rise the first time. If you haven't opened your Bibles already, we're in Luke chapter 1. I'd invite you to turn there and and follow along as as we go. You saw some of the background from this video that we just showed. I think Luke's, uh, excuse me, Zechariah's story would make a great Christmas feature on TV because God gave Zechariah and his wife the gift that they most longed for, which was a child, uh, something that they had long stopped hoping for and even expecting. And not just any child, but a son who would play the role of ushering in the Messiah himself, would be the greatest prophet that had ever arisen, John the Baptist. Now, Zechariah initially doubted this miracle would happen, and so uh, he was struck dumb for the entire duration of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And we're going to pick up at verse 67, when his mouth is finally opened and we see the first thoughts that explode out of his lips. We see him celebrate the Messiah. Note that the first word in this verse is his, talking about John the Baptist. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. And yet, the first thing that Zechariah talks about is not his son, John, but it's Jesus. And all of the verbs in the first several verses talk about what God is doing through his Savior, Jesus. Notice, too, it says uh, in verse 68, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. Now, Jesus hasn't been born yet. This is about six months before Jesus was born. 
So how can he say he has come? Because through the eyes of faith, this is as good as done. The bullet has been fired and it's speeding toward its target. The ball is, in, is rolling. Nothing's going to stop it from happening. And look at these verbs, things that God has done. He has come to his people. Verse 68. How do you show your friends and family that you really love them? This time of year, you might call them, you might send them a card, but the really close ones, you try to go visit, right? You go there, you visit them. And God, when he wanted to show himself and come to his people, he didn't just send a card or send a representative. He came. He came himself. And what did he do? Why did he come? To redeem them, verse 68. To redeem us. That language makes you think of uh, like a slave standing on an auction block with his hands and feet in shackles. And someone comes up and pays the price for that slave to buy them to set them free. That's what redemption is. How is God doing this? Verse 69, He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of His servant David. Who's He talking about? He's talking about Jesus, the great, 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 great grandson of King David. And think of a, a ram or a, um, a goat with a big horn, a curly horns on the top. You think about one of those next to maybe a sheep. Which one would you rather have fighting for you? Probably the one with the horns, right? That's why this is a symbol of strength. He's saying he's raised up a strong Savior for us from the house of his servant David. As he said, verse 70, through his holy prophets of long ago. This isn't something new. Jesus is not a um, plan B or a, a good idea that God had in the moment. God has been saying this through people like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Malachi and Daniel for centuries. And now he's come. Those ancient prophecies are coming true. To show mercy to, his an to our ancestors. He mentions Abraham. We've talked a lot about Abraham. And uh, to remember his holy covenant, verse 73, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. And then Zechariah's pray, so he talks about what God is doing in this Savior. And then he, he talks about um, God's goal in all of this. Why is God doing this? Verse 74, to rescue us, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Now Zechariah, remember, is a priest. This is a man who's saturated with the Hebrew scriptures. He knows the stories of his people. And so when he, when he says he has rescued us from our enemies, here's what he's thinking about. He thinks about the waters of the sea crashing in over the, the chariots and horses of Egypt. God rescues his people. He, he thinks about, about the huge army of the Assyrians camped around Jerusalem and the angel of the Lord decimating that army during the night and sending them fleeing. He, he probably thinks about David, this young shepherd boy with a sling and a stone walking up to the giant Goliath and through the power of the Lord defeating him and the Philistine army and rescuing God's people from them. Maybe he thinks about Queen uh, Esther in Persia who through her humility and wisdom she saves the people of God from a plot to annihilate them. See, again and again and again God has rescued his people from their enemies. And why? To enable them to serve him without fear. Serve him without fear. Now, Zechariah also knew, as a priest, what it was like to serve God with, with fear, right? He, his robes had been stained with blood again and again from, from slitting the throat of a sacrificial animal on the altar. 
He knew the, the price that sin required. He knew what it felt like to enter into the Holy of Holies, that inner chamber in the temple where only a priest could go once a year and to sit there and to tremble in God's presence. Every day into the temple, he passed the armed temple guards whose job it was to make sure that nobody could just waltz into God's presence who was unauthorized to do so. He knows the seriousness and the, the fear involved in worshiping God. And he's saying, God is doing this to enable us to serve him without fear. Without fear in holiness and righteousness all our days. No more bloody sacrifices, no more priesthood, no more barriers and buffers between God and people. Because Jesus, you know why, because Jesus put an end to all that when he died, when he was buried, and when he rose again. He was in the place of Zechariah the priest. He took the place of the sacrificial lamb. And he took the place of the sinner, like you and me. And as we catch a glimpse of that truth, like Zechariah did, as we behold that, we will not be able to not celebrate Jesus. Zechariah is celebrating Jesus, what he's going to come and do. And, and at Christmas, we, we celebrate him. I mean, it sounds obvious to say it, but we celebrate Jesus at Christmas. Now, we do that in church. We're, gonna, we're doing that now. We're going to do that tonight. But let that be the same around your tables tomorrow. Let it be the same when you talk with your family and friends. Uh, let it be the same when you're sitting and thinking that you're, you're celebrating Jesus and what he's done. Now think about this guy, Zechariah. He's holding or in the presence of this great gift, this son that he's been waiting for. And yet to him, uh, Jesus was even more important than this son. Um, his, his celebration didn't center on the, the boy John. His celebration centered on Jesus. Let that be true of us as well. I think it's tempting for all of us to make Christmas all about our families and to be so excited for the family stuff that Jesus is kind of over there. We, we include him, but he's, he's not the center of everything. Don't, don't let Christmas center on your family. I mean, as good as, and great as family is, is nothing compared to the gift of Christ. And it can't sustain the kind of celebration and joy that Jesus can. Now that may be comforting for you if, you're, if you don't have a lot of family or if your family is hard, gatherings are hard. You can say, you can say Jesus uh, is the reason. It might be harder for you to put Jesus at the center if you love your family and if you're you know, surrounded by, by fun and by people you love. But I want to challenge us all to make space for Jesus at the center of what we do. I, I think you can do that by prioritizing prayer, even if you have a house full of guests tomorrow. I think you can do that by, by intentionally speaking about Jesus when you're gathered together. And making him kind of like your guest of honor as much as you can in your power. Uh, let your celebrations just center on him. I think that's what we can learn from Zechariah. To celebrate our Savior. And then secondly, we can prepare others to meet our Savior. I can imagine now Zechariah pausing in this spirit-inspired song. And as his friends and neighbors watch with, with awe, he walks over to his wife Elizabeth and he takes his son John and cradles him in his arms. And as those 
tiny black eyes stare up at him. He looks down and says, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. He's looking into the face of the greatest prophet who's ever been born, the one who wouldn't just point to Jesus in the distant future, but would stand in the presence of Jesus and say, Look, there he is. I can't imagine a greater privilege for Zechariah having his son be that person. And you see, he's more excited about Jesus than he is about the son himself. It's the son's role that he's so excited about. You, my child, will be a prophet of the Most High. And so Zechariah sings over him, verses 77 to 79. He says, little John, your your name that means God is gracious, by the way, John. One day you will give our people the most precious message, a message about salvation from the, for the forgiveness of sins, a message about the tender mercy of God, a message about salvation rising like a sun into our dark world. Now John had a one-of-a-kind role that will never be repeated, right? John <coughs> ushered in, literally ushered in Jesus in his ministry um, to be a herald of the good news. It's, he was a prophet. And there will never be another John the Baptist, but your role and my role as believers is very similar to what John had to do. His job was to point people toward Jesus and to get people ready to meet their Savior. And that's our job too. His job was to tell people the most important knowledge, which was the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins. What do you think the world's greatest need is? Let me make it more personal. What's what's your greatest need? need? There's a lot of ways we can answer that question. Maybe your greatest need is to be healthier physically and emotionally and mentally, you know? And we live in this um, Oprah-fied and Dr. Oz-ified culture where there's plenty of people who will give you all kinds of tips about how to be healthier, how to be happier, how to feel better about your life. But your greatest need is not to be healthier. Or maybe your greatest need is for people around you to change. (laughs) Lots of luck on that, Barry says. Right, good luck. But seriously, we can think if only they wouldn't be um, so hard to me, if only they would treat me better, if only that person hadn't abused me or manipulated me. And... The truth is we've all been hurt by people and that those wounds are real. But our greatest need is not for the world around us to change. Our greatest need is for our sin to be forgiven. That's what it boils down to. It's the biggest problem is not that we're not healthy enough or that other people have done things to us. Our greatest problem is that we're we're rebels against God in our sinful nature. We've run far from Him. Um, We have an incurable disease of sin that will be fatal if untreated, and we don't have the treatment for it ourselves. I came across this illustration um, from a Roman poet, Virgil, many of you have heard of him, who described a particularly, particularly cruel and gruesome punishment that the Romans would inflict on prisoners. As Virgil wrote, the living and dead at his command were coupled face to face and hand to hand till choked with stench in loathed embraces tied, the lingering wretches pined away and died. How's that for some poetry, huh? Translation, a living prisoner would be shackled face to face with a a dead corpse and eventually the contamination from that dying, the dead person would kill the living person. Our biggest problem is that we are shackled to a corpse, 
of sin that will kill us unless we're cut loose from that, unless we're forgiven of those things. That's why the gospel is such good news. That's why John is, Zechariah is saying, you'll give your, the people knowledge of for, salvation through the forgiveness of sin. Because the gospel solves our biggest problem, which is our, our sin, forgiveness of sin. That's why Zechariah was so excited. He knew the, the cost of, of sin, being a priest, and what needed to be done. He knew that there would be forgiveness for sin. That's the same message that we believe now. That through what Jesus did, we can be forgiven and healed and cut away from that that corpse of sin. And that's the message we believe and we're called to, to point others to, like John the Baptist. Now, have you realized that that's actually your greatest need? Maybe some of us haven't. Maybe we were think that our greatest need is just to, to feel better or to um, be healthier or to, you know, other pe- that other people wouldn't do things to us. But our greatest need is for our sin to be forgiven. If you know that, think about the people who cross your life, you cross your path every day, your coworkers, the person who rings you up for your coffee, um, your boss, your family members, maybe some people you'll see tonight and tomorrow. That's their greatest need too, is for the forgiveness of their sins. They have a lot of secondary needs to that like we do, but the greatest and first need is the forgiveness of our sins. And think about all those people who who cross your path and think, will they be prepared to meet Jesus? Because they're going to meet Him either when they die or when He comes again. Everybody's going to meet Him. So how can we help prepare others to meet Him? Like John the Baptist. So celebrate the Savior, celebrate Jesus, and prepare others to meet him as well. That's what Zechariah's song is telling us. It says that the dark night of sin and death is over. Uh, Jesus has come to set us free so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness all our days. And that's something that should be impossible not to celebrate, right? Like those Inuit people who it's impossible for them not to celebrate the return of the sun after the polar night. And if Jesus is the sun who has risen on your life, it'll be impossible not to tell others about him as well. My favorite Christmas carol is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You remember that for trivia someday? I think Zechariah might agree with me. He might like it too, because here's the third verse. Actually, sing it with me if you know it. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all He brings. Risen with healing in His wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Amen. Let's close our worship now with the hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Jesus Christ is Born. Just so you know, I wasn't making a smart remark.